friends, welcome to night number three of the Dreams and Encounters Conference. Guys, let's welcome the whole world to Open Door Church. Boom! <laughs> welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Guys, I want to introduce a good friend of mine. He was here last night, and I spent the day with him today. And you know what? I love this guy. He is my friend. He's my brother. Guys, this is Brother Jamie Galloway. He's in the house. Come on up here, Brother Jamie. <laughs> Hallelujah. So today, um, Jamie and I, man, we, we did a bunch of running around. He stayed, out at the, uh, he stayed out the ranch last night. When I came down and picked him up this morning, he was feeding my ducks. You really were, weren't you, man? I really was. Yep. Oh, I really was. There you go. And then uh, and when we pulled up last night, there was a fox that was after my ducks, right? Yep, absolutely. Friends, don't let the little foxes spoil the vine. Amen. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, I think we're going to get into what the spirit of Herod is, but the spirit of Herod goes with uh, the verse where Jesus was talking about Herod. He said, you go tell that fox this. Yeah. And before we get into that, I yeah. want to say this, you know, the difference between 777 and 888 is what? 111. Man, I want to tell you, so 111. 111 is so crazy cool, guys. It's, it's, it's really my favorite number besides 120. But really, anytime God uses any number, it turns out to be my favorite number every time. It's like, that's my new favorite number. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. It is awesome. So 111, is there any 111 people? You just see 111 everywhere? So one, of course, represents unity, right? One, of course, represents unity. And, and when I first started searching out 111, okay, I... I the first layer of revelation I've got is simply, I'm here with you. We're unified. It's a prophetic marker that represents the presence of the Lord being made manifest. Okay? But I want you guys to understand that, you know, if you, do, if you see 222, which has all kinds of cool meanings, including signs, miracles, and wonders, because the only verse in the entire Bible that has all three signs, miracles, and wonders is Acts 222. Okay? Or if it's 333, or if it's 444, or 555, or whatever. So, like, 444 is 111 times 4. Mind blown. <laughs> 888, Jesus, is 111, God being made manifest in the form of new beginnings. Jesus, 8. 11, 11? You're not seeing that, are you? I'm just teasing, man. I'm <laughs> you don't want to see that one. I, Whoa. I, oh, yeah, we that's won't not tell you, good. <laughs> That's not good. No, I see, I see 11, 11 every day. I saw, I saw it last night. I saw it this morning. Um, I was praying with uh, Mama Virginia yesterday morning on the way in, and as soon as we got done, she said, And King Jesus, I see that it's 11, 11, and I know what that means, that you're just here with us, and we love you so much. Amen. I go, wow. Okay, cool. So what were we talking about before we started talking about We were talking about, about the leaven of Herod, which is interesting because the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees, Jesus mentions this when he's in the boat with his disciples right, right after the, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Yes. And so here's how it's so interesting, plays into the numbers and everything like that. So they get into the boat and they begin to argue that they have no bread. But the scripture specifically says that they brought one loaf of bread with them in the boat. So where did this bread go? They, by the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, could not see that loaf of bread with them in the boat. Wow. They couldn't identify it. They couldn't see the miracle. That was leftover miracle from the miracle that Jesus had just done. And so what, you know, what happens is, when you have the leaven of Herod in your life, it actually stops you from being able to see the miracle. Okay, so let's, let's define what the leaven of Herod is. Now, there's different... First, I want to just tell you, if, if, if you have a next-level revelation on any of this, this doesn't cancel your, re, your revelation, okay? There's layers to this, okay? And it's one of, the, one of the criticism that I tend to get when I really you know, when I'm preaching really deep things, is really deep thinkings are saying, you don't know what that means. It actually means this. And I'm like, no, well, no, it means this and that. Right, totally. Like, it. Come on, come on. I mean, so I'm not, my revelation does not cancel your revelation. But the first leaven of Herod would be a political spirit. 
Yes, absolutely. Okay? So the first understanding that I can think of would be a political spirit that you can't even operate in the kingdom because you're so political. Yeah, and, and there is a very fine line there That's right. between government That's right. and politics. That's right. Come on. He doesn't tell us not to be a government oriented yes. and understand how to infiltrate yes. even our own government because we need to bad, yes bad 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 but to, to to also at the same time embrace the political spirit right. yes where you try to look good to get ahead and all of that stuff and and you end up compromising your values just like Herod how about that that's pretty cool right okay but now let's go to another revelation and you and I were talking about this earlier and I I honestly had never thought about this before until you said this to me. And I went, oh, my gosh, that's awesome. And I'm going to preach that all over the world, and people are going to think I'm brilliant. Yeah. Well, hey, and it came from take you. It, so. Take it. Take it. I steal all your stuff anyway. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, it's the leaven of Herod is you came to see magic and not see the miracle because there's a very big difference. Herod wanted to see Jesus perform it says, perform some cures, as if Jesus was a magician. But he didn't understand that Jesus was not a magician. Because what does magic do? It might wow you, but it doesn't change your heart. And so he, he refuses to show Herod, Jesus refuses to go to Herod and show Herod about what he's capable of, because he knows all he's going to do is embrace it as if it's a form of entertainment. And so he's saying, don't just be entertained by what you've seen, but allow it to change you. You know, the type of people I like to be around, like you, Troy, right? You see 111, or you're driving down the road, it turns 111, you're like, ho, oh, You know, like you're in the spirit already, because somebody else might be like, what's the big deal? But you're going to let that 111 change your life. Yeah. That's the leaven of Herod, and you have to be careful because if you let that le leaven in, and, and according uh, to, to the, the, the feast, one of the feasts, they were to go to the house through their own house and actually eliminate all the Make leavens sure in their no house. there's no leaven in the house whatsoever. And so we have to do this annually. We have to have an annual checkup in our life. Am I, Jesus says, be cautious, be aware. Don't let this leaven get a hold of your life. Are you staying fresh in the miracles that God is doing in your life. You know, you're going, God, I need, I need, Lord, I need a breakthrough. I need a financial breakthrough. And you find a dollar on the floor. Are you going to let that move you to believe that God's going to provide the rest? Or are you just going to go, a dollar? It's a dollar. And you got to let it move you. So it's, it's the exact opposite. Okay, and by the way, looking for the big dramatic thing goes with the political spirit. Totally, it yes. Goes, it goes with the political spirit. So, so it, it's, it's the difference between, okay, Lord, if you barely move, my response is going to be awesome as opposed to I expect you to move in a huge way and then you might get a response out of me. Yeah. I, I, was, okay. with, I was with Bob Jones at, wow. at lunch. And Bob, he's gone not out today, to be with the Lord. Because I was with you at No, lunch. not today. I was like, was Bob there? I didn't see him. We were, not good. We, we were together. I was with Bob at his favorite uh, stop Sizzler. <laughs> and, wow. and so this was wow. years ago when Bob was still here with us. He's now with the Lord. But Bob, and if you've ever heard his name, he, he was one of the most premier prophets of our time. And he had uh, shaped really a lot of the move of God today through his prophetic uh, revelation and, and prophecies. But I remember going out to lunch with him, and, he, and he, he had several questions, odd questions, every time they were odd. But it always had meaning. But it, I'm sitting there, and he's, he's eating this steak, this grisly steak from Sizzler. And he looks down, and in the middle of the table, he says, there it is. And I, and I go, what? And I look down, and it was a tiny gold fleck, just a tiny gold fleck. And I go, what is it, Bob? He goes, it's the glory of God. Now, it was the tiniest, this is a man that has had, you know, thousands of angelic visitations, you know, full-on reports of raising from the dead, you know, crazy stuff. And he's seen the Lord Jesus. He was dead. He came back to life, seen the Lord, you know, seen him in his glory. And, and he, he says, this is the glory of God. And I looked at it. I looked at him. I said, all of it? 
I'm thinking, how is it he sees so much from so little? But it was a revelation to me. That, I love how you just said that. Guys, are you guys going to be the kind of people, are we going to decide that we're going to see so much from so little? Amen. Amen. That we're not Herod. Jesus doesn't have to come in, you know, doing a backwards somersault like he's, you know, John Belushi, right? And, and the Blues Brothers are here, right? Jesus ain't a soul man, I'll tell you that. Oh, oh no, he's a spirit man. <laughs> so, anyway. But <laughs> So, so, but nonetheless, I, I, can we catch up something so subtle? Because the way that the spirit wants to work is he knows that we are in this environment that is so fleshly and carnal. Yeah. And he's like, but are you looking for me? Because I'm going to whisper to you. And, you know, we hear about the Word of God being called the still, small voice of God, right? But there's a setting for our heart that has to be still and it has to be small. And we can't be too big and too busy in the midst of everything that we're doing that we go, whoa. You see that little bitty tiny thing right there? The Spirit of God's here. He didn't have to show me. Gold didn't show. I have to show up everywhere. Look, he's here right here, and I'm just going to celebrate it. I'm in. I'm all the way in right now. He's not going to have to work on me for another two hours before I finally get there. I'm in. And that has to do with... How you, a lot of people are like, okay, I want to have next level encounters. Here's what I'm saying. You've had the gold flake show up and you went, and then you went right back to watching Fox News and griping about everything and saying, and then saying, I don't know how the whole country going to hell. I don't know why God doesn't move for me. Oh, he did. You just didn't see it. He has, you just haven't recognized it. And when he has, you have not stewarded it. You didn't let it impact you. And so, like, okay, that's a natural response. If you're going to tell me that on the first night we had 777 people, and then on the Wednesday night we had 888, and this is a dreams conference, an encounters conference where I'm talking about numbers, and God's like, your stuff is cool, but my stuff is cooler, that's the way that you respond to that. You go, wow! You just go, well... But I don't know where God was at today when that lady was yelling at me today. <laughs> no, you got, you have to let it impact you. And that's a, that's a predetermined setting. Yeah, totally. It's from hunger. Yeah. You know, when you're hungry, everything gets I- exciting to you, right? I yes. mean, I don't yes. know about you, but I've been sometimes so hungry yes. that even the book of Ecclesiastes looks good. Wow. <laughs> You really are holy, brother. No, I'm serious. You know, like you can take from something, Man. you get hungry. Now, I've been on the other side where I have no hunger, no emotional response, and I'm dead in the water. I'm like, God, I can't feel you. I don't know where you are, but I'm going to do my devotions as if I'm hungry. And in those moments, that's when you're force feeding yourself. See, you have to go, you don't just, hunger just doesn't happen. It happens because you force fed yourself in the spirit and then you grow in your appetite because it's something that is, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, strong coffee. You start off with the sugar and the extra whipped cream and all that type of stuff. And pretty soon you're graduating. You yeah, know. you want to drink it with a fork after a while. <laughs> and that doesn't happen overnight. Your, you, your palate begins to hunger for more. And so the hunger and thirst for righteousness is sometimes it's, it's lifting up holy hands when you don't feel like it. And, and, and you're right, you're about to pass out because you had a long day of exhaustion, kids are wearing you out, you know, you have no idea how you're going to pay the bills, all that stuff, and you got to get some sleep. But before you do, while you're passing out, you go, oh, Lord Jesus, I worship you. I need you to speak. I'm go- you, you, that breath that you prayed in that moment, that took energy that you didn't have. And God honors that. He sees that as hunger, and he'll pour out on that hungry soul. It's, it's about maintaining your desperation for the Lord. Okay? And that you have to decide. Okay? You have to decide at whatever age you are, but don't tell anybody Oh, my God. Oh, man. What a like nut. It. What a nut. You can't tell anybody. So anyway, so. 
So, I forgot what I was talking about. Desperation. Yeah, desperation. Maintaining. That at, at, at whatever at whatever age that you are and however you've walked with the Lord, you determine if God is inviting me to, in to have a deeper walk and if he is saying, I have more for you, that you go, I haven't really lived a lifestyle of going after that, but I am now. And I'm going to start going after that. And, and, and this is even, you know, I've been walking with God since 86. And, and, and I mean, I've had a really awesome, incredible walk with Jesus. I mean, I really have. And I'm about to share an encounter, a, a pretty recent encounter <laughs> that has changed things for me. But, but on top of that, friends, I, there is, there's never been a time that I have not been in transition. When have I ever not been in transition? When has this church ever not been in transition? I tell everybody, brother, when they sign up, you know, at the one-on-one class, I say, if, if you don't like change, you're not going to like us. Because how we are now is not going to be how we are six months from now. We're going to continue to change. We're going to continue to change. We're going to continue to grow. And we just learned, you're like, like, dude, when I hire somebody, I ain't hiring them to do the job they're doing now. I'm hiring them to do the job 10 levels from now because we're going to be there quick. Wow, come on. Right? Come and on. so that's a lifestyle, that, and that's a, that's, that's a kingdom lifestyle. And that doesn't come from Texas, man. That comes from heaven. That comes from your father. I want to just, uh, I've had some crazy encounters. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some pretty major ones that are, down, that are low, and then I'm going to get to the big one. Okay, is that all right? Oh, yeah, I want to hear. Because I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell a crazy encounter I had, you know, that, but then I'll, but then I'll get into one that I that we really need to spend time and unpack. Um, what's the longest fast you've ever been on? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just jo- I'm joking. It's like, man, it's like a chick. <laughs> it's like, that is embarrassing. Totally. I was like, shit. It's like I swear he's like a girl. Totally joking. I'm like, you gotta okay. <laughs> that was great. I did a 40 day. I've done a 40-day. I've done a 40-day. Now, it wasn't a uh, 40-day water. It was smoothies and water. Liquefied liquid. chicken fried steak. Yeah. Yeah. I've done those fast, too. If it's liquid, it's legal to me. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I promise you. Especially if I'm going to do like a 40-day fast, dude, I will wear out a blender. I'm talking about <laughs> U.S. Leanna. Do am I going to need to go buy a new blender? Yes, ma'am. If I make it, you know, if I make it into the 30s, you know, or close to 40, yes, ma'am. You, you, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was on a 40-day fast seeking God in a very, very, very incredibly radical way. And by the way, friends, if you seek him in a radical way, you will find him in a radical way. Come on. And, and yes. it's, one, it's a principle that I learned very, very, very early in my walk with King Jesus is that if I want God to show up in incredible ways, and, and if I want God to respond to my prayer in incredible ways, then I had better learn how to respond to him in incredible ways. And I had better learn to, if, I, if I'm going to seek him, if I'm going to find, I, I have to believe that he is like, you watch Troy. I bet you anything he's going to seek me right now. Watch, up, oh, up, oh, up, oh, look at him. There he goes. Oh, here he comes. He's awesome. He's awesome. Okay. So you have to believe that, that God wants you in his presence. You have to believe that he's happy with you seeking him. And I mean, and if you have hardcore daddy issues, you're, you're, going to have to get, you're going to have to get past that. I mean, you just are. You're just going to have to get past that, and you're going to have to say, Father, reveal your heart to me. So anyway, I, I went to Big Bend National Park, which was, to me at that time, was like really far away, okay? And went to Big Bend National Park. I drove my truck until the road ran out, and then I drove across the desert until I couldn't drive anymore. And I had several gallons of water, and I had a little bitty tent, and I made this little bitty tent, and I had a Bible, a flashlight, and a pistol. That sounds like a proper fast. That was it. (laughs) And uh, I sought the Lord on a certain night after that. Man, guys, the stars are just so, you know, that's the darkest place on the North American continent, and that's why that big observatory is there. And you guys know I love the stars. And I was sitting in the tent door. And I want to tell you, I, I found out later on that Abraham was sitting in the door of his tent whenever God showed up to him. Wow. And so I was in a Come prophetic on. posture that I didn't even know. 
Okay? I didn't even know. I mean, you do know that there's certain prophetic postures, right? It's why we raise our hands. It's why it's, it's all that. And, and heaven responds to that. So I'm there, bro, and uh, I, I have this. It, it, it wasn't a dream because I was awake. It was definitely a vision, but it was very much like a dream. It felt like a dream. I saw it very, very, very clearly, and it was crazy cool, so much so that when it was over, I didn't know if I had just, if I had been asleep or if I was awake. I didn't have a clue, okay? So, but nonetheless, I saw this, this cloud of glory, and it was alive somehow, and it was kind of softly moving, and this, this cloud of the tangible presence, the heaviness, the weightiness of God, and then I saw this hand come out right in front of me, and I honestly, when I saw it, I thought, God's going to feed me, because I was starving to death. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, what is that? I'm totally freaking out, man. I'm freaking out. I was starting to hit my it's like a pop tart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, yes. Like, you're so good to me, Jesus. And in this hand, I saw nine marbles in, in his hand. And it was just right in front of me. And when I looked at it, Jamie, I could zoom in. And I zoomed in on one, and it was the jawbone of a donkey. And then I zoomed back out. And then I looked at another one. I zoomed in on that, and it was a tent peg. And I zoomed back out. And then I looked at another one. And I zoomed in on it, and it was a left hand. And then I zoomed in on the fourth one, and it was a small army. And I backed up, and I said, God, what is that? And he, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, these are the nine small things in the book of Judges. Search out the matter. So he told me. Now, I know that nine represents judgment and fruit bearing, that you can tell what it, you, you can judge something by the fruit that it bears. Okay? Right. And he said, these are the nine small things in the book of Judges. And then he said, search out the matter. So I spent the rest of the day... Um, I spent the rest of the day searching out the nine spawn. You know, there's a jawbone of the donkey, right? There's a lady that kills a king with a tent peg. Wow. Woo. Scary woman. There is, dude, the brother went to sleep. She nailed it in the side of his head. That, you don't mess with her, man. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you go right to sleep right there, baby. It's going to be all right. Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> wow. There's another king who gets killed by a small piece of a millstone that a lady dropped off a tower and it hit him in the head. They're Gideon's army of 300. And so what God told me through this was the smaller you get, the greater I'll use you. The smaller you get, the greater I'll use you. Come on, man. Okay. This so is that, amazing stuff. Okay, so, so that I went home with that and I was like, this has to change my life. I, I don't know how many people have had an encounter like that before, but I have. And if I don't let it impact my life, because I want to tell you, it's very easy to go on with your life after you have a mighty encounter with God. You go, no, no, it'll change me. No, 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 no. Miracles do not change you. You submitting your heart to Jesus changes you. And that's why, that's why the Israelites, man, when they came out, after they'd seen all these signs and miracles and wonders, they still didn't have a heart, you know, for the things of the Lord. And like, well, dad gum it. What, they were still conformed to Egypt, right? And then Jesus himself, whenever he was talking to the cities around Galilee, he talked to Capernaum and Bethesda, and there's another one there. And he said, you know what? I did all these miracles among you, and because you do not respond to me, I'm putting a curse on these towns. You guys remember that? And he also said, he, he basically said, if I don't, I'm going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because they would have jumped through amazing hoops if they had seen the things that you guys saw. And, he said, he, and so Jesus put a curse upon those cities. And friends, to this day, all of Galilee is all rebuilt, but those three cities are nothing but uh, ruins. You come go with me to Israel next year, you'll see that. I'll take you there. So there is actually, listen, it, it insults the Lord for us to not properly respond to his encounters that he has for us. Totally. I've, I've seen that. And, and the thing is, when, when you do have an encounter with Jesus, you will be transformed. You will, even after a miracle, Jesus says no one can curse God directly after 
They've seen a miracle. It's, it's as if there's a space-time constraint you got it. You got it. It's, where it's they actually live in, uh, in awe and awareness of the holiness of God after, they've, after you performed a miracle. Now, it doesn't mean they won't ever go on to make a mistake or anything like that or sin or, or whatever. But there is something holy about God's presence that will change you, but it's all about abiding. It's not just a one-time thing or, you know, 20 years ago when I was in my, you know, hunger and I was in my glory days and all. It's a continual abiding. And when you abide, that doesn't mean that you abide in, the, in just in one season. You abide in every season because the, every season has its own issues, victories, struggles, all of that, that type of stuff. And, and yet he's giving us the strength to abide in those seasons. And what can separate us from the love of God? What can Amen. separate us from the love of God? So how, so listen, guys, we have to be able to respond. We, we, you, you predetermine your responses to God. I mean, you have to do that. It says, um, it says in Romans 1, I was just thinking about this verse. It says, uh, I, I, I love this verse. It's, it's like a key scripture in, in my own life, Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of him, even the creation, even, it, wait, even the eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, for they are without excuse. And then it says this, for when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but their foolish hearts were darkened. And I'm just sitting there wow. thinking about that, that, okay, yes, there is the, the, the transforming manifest presence of Jesus, and, and there is also a miracle, a, a, a something that Jesus will do, and what determines if your impact or not is are you thankful? Are you going to be the one or are you going to be the other nine? And are you going to come back to Jesus and let Jesus change your life? Because then he says your faith has made you whole, literally meaning, okay, those guys, they left here, they're healed of leprosy, they don't have open wounds, but they still don't have a nose. They still don't have fingers, but your faith has made you whole. Wow. Right? I know, I, know about, I know about lepers because we have 13 leprosy colonies in India. Did you know we have 13 leprosy villages? I did not know that. I'll have I to take know. you there, dude. Yeah, you you so love it, man. You wow. so love it. So, so I, there, if, if we do not respond to when God begins to bring his encounters to us, our hearts become darkened. And your heart will literally get hardened. So I think that just going into this thing, knowing and understanding that if you seek him in a radical way, you will find him in a radical way. If you, if you determine that you will be passionate about King Jesus, right? And then also that you will respond in a way that is thankful and in a way that glorifies God. What is it, what is it guys, that Jesus says, herein is my Father glorified that you what? Bear much fruit. Come on. Come okay, on. so this is how we respond to an encounter with the Lord. So I know that you've had some crazy encounters. Can you can you give me a brief one? Can you give me one? I don't know. What's what what's yeah. something that so, happened in your life? So that you know, you? there was a time in my life where I was not having encounters, and I was watching friends of mine and other people I would minister to have encounters all around me. So I got hungry, and I and I had been living in a prayer life and all that stuff. But I didn't know how to actually come by faith to the Holy of Holies, to the mercy seat, right? And so I'm going, God, you got to show me. So I start waiting on God. And this is at a time in my life where I had free time. I had no kids at that point in my life, you know. And so I was waiting on God two to four hours a day in stillness. I'm talking about I would, I would, Everything was done, no other, you know, no, uh, distractions or anything like that. And I would sit in stillness for two to four hours a day, like this. If I had an itch on my face, I wouldn't itch it. I would let it go. I mean, it was like I was disciplined and I was hungry. Wow. Now, seven months later, I was burnt out. I did that for seven months. I was hungry, and you, I didn't have a could have been a vision. I didn't have a warm fuzzy. There was nothing. I was like, and I literally broke down. I had a nervous breakdown. I was like, God, this is ridiculous. I had a nervous breakdown in the presence of God. I was like, ah, what is your problem? 
And so, you know what he told me? He said, I want you to get up in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock, and I will speak to you. Wait on me at that time. So 2 o'clock, bam, 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 alarm goes off. I wake up, splash some cold water on my face, and I go, all right, Lord, here I am. <laughs> right? I, I sit, I'm cross-legged in my bed, and I'm like, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. I bang my head like a few times on the bed behind me, and, 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 and you know, the, the, and I'm sitting there going, God, come on, 45 minutes into it, I go, I don't believe you. <laughs> and so I was, I was so disheartened, and I go, I did this, and you haven't come. Good night, Jesus. And I, and I go to lay down. Now, when I lay down, just as I'm about to lay down and fall asleep, I'm, I'm drifting off. All of a sudden, the spirit realm opens up, and I see an angel in with like my eyes, even though my eyes were closed, my eyes open to another world. And I saw an angel of God come out of the corner of the room, and there was a harp being played while he was walking towards me. And as he's walking towards me, I hear this harp. The first thing in my head is a harp. Are you serious? This is the devil. I'm thinking this, like, you're trying to con me, and you think the harp is going to soften me or something. I know it. You know, this is, I, you're too predictable, right? But it wasn't the devil. It was an angel from the presence of God. And when the angel spoke, it literally sounded, and I've never heard this sound before, but the only sound I could connect it to was what Revelation calls the voice of many waters. It's, his voice sounded like many waters speaking at the same time. I've heard that voice. Have you heard that voice? Yeah. And, and, and when I, I saw him and he says, he literally says to me, hi, like, like he's excited to be there. And I was like, I go, uh-uh, no. <laughs> and, and I'm like trying to force my body, even though my spirit is awake, I'm in this. This is not a dream. This is not a vision. I'm in this. My spirit is awake. My body is asleep. And I, and I, and I know because your body is connected to your spirit. It's called the silver cord in the book of Ecclesiastes. But when your, your body is still connected to your spirit. And so when, when, when I'm there in the spirit, I'm trying to get my body somehow by my willpower to wake back up and get out of this thing. So I do. I manage to wake up out of this thing. And I'm like, ah! And when I get up out of this, I immediately flip the lights on. And ever since then, I've been sleeping with the lights on. Literally, I don't ever sleep with the lights off, not because I'm afraid of the devil, but because I'm afraid of God. And so I, I get on my knees on my bed, and I begin to pray. I said, don't you dare do that to me again, Jesus. You think you're going to play? That is, that's, I didn't like that at all. I am not for that. I want you to know. And, and so... I went back to bed, and I kind of was like, you know, shaking, but I fell back asleep. And so the next night, I didn't get up. I didn't get up. I was like, I'm done with this waiting game and all that type of stuff, because when the Lord really does show up, that's when you're like, I'm in trouble. Okay, and so I wake up in the middle of the night. What? At, I have been fully asleep. I wake up, and this time, I'm literally out of my body. And I know it because I see my body there. Now, you might go, what kind of conference is this? <laughs> wait, a, oh, wait, hold the phone. Did he just say out of body? Yes, I, I said that. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12. And if you read between the lines, it's actually even more fascinating because Paul was confused whether he was in his body or out of his body when he went to heaven. Now, here's the thing. We, maybe we might have faith that Paul was out of his body when he went to heaven. But I thought, man, Paul actually thinks that he can go in his body to the third heaven. That's, that's right. That's that is even more fascinating to me. That this man, pre-death, pre-resurrection, in his mortal body, 
Yes, he's a believer in Jesus, but he's still got mortality in him, as Scripture says. He has yet to receive the celestial body. And, and so he's going to heaven, possibly in his natural body, his physical man. And I thought, man, this is, that's amazing. So here I am back in bed, and I know I'm out of my body, and I'm looking there, but my, my bed is literally in between my torso. It's going between my torso. And I'm telling you, what happened in my life after that seven months was three months of visitation where every night, whether I was asleep or waiting on God, I would go into visit, visions and visitations until a night I saw Jesus. And when I saw Jesus, I remember I was waiting on him. I laid down, I fell asleep, and boom, all of a sudden I'm out of my body. And I'm with him at a bus station. Now, I didn't make this up. He planned this whole date, not me, okay? First date at a bus station, that's not my, my idea of romance with Jesus, okay? But he liked it. He was there, and I'm telling you, he looked like something out of a romance novel. When I saw him, he had hair blown in the wind. His hair was gold and black and beautiful, and it was just gorgeous. And I, I zoomed in on his skin. He was floating, literally levitating before me, floating and, and kind of being ushered to me by the glory of God. And, and the wind was blowing in his hair, and he's looking right at me, and I'm like, oh. You know, I'm, an, I'm blown away, and I remember he had these big blue eyes that were like pools of oceans, literally. And I look in his eyes, and I know he knows everything about me, yet he still is so radically in love with me. He's not ashamed to call me his own. He loves me who I am. And I literally, in that moment, I look at him, and this is what I say. You're the real Jesus. <laughs> he looks down at me. He's smiling. He's like, as if to say, uh-huh, like that's all you got? <laughs> and, that, and, and, and then here's, what I, here's, here's the parable in it. He then takes me to the bus. Day, bu to the bus. I get on a bus in this encounter. And, and I see Jesus is at the back of the bus. I see a man who is driving the bus. He's got some addictions. He's got some issues. He's got a bunch of different problems. He believes in Jesus, but yet he has not fully yielded. And I know this bus represents, I, while this is happening, I have the interpretation happening right in my spirit, that this bus represents his relationship with God. Yes, he has a relationship with God. Has Jesus taken the wheel? Not yet. But he's still on his bus. And as time grows in this man's life, Jesus is going to get closer and closer until he takes the wheel. And that was the end of that encounter. That's incredible. Wow. Okay. Listen, I, I want to, I, we, we, we're supposed to end at 9 o'clock, and it's like 9 right now. I, I, but I want to, I'm not going to end right now. And I want to say this, it's not treason if you need to get up and go, okay? I'm not going to be here until, until 10 o'clock, but I, I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want you to, you know, of course, Judas got up and left, you know, I just throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really do mean that. I mean that, man. It's 9 o'clock. Man, we all, we all work for a living. This is going to go. There in, goes Jerry. Yeah, there goes Jerry right there. <laughs> there he goes. But honestly, man, if, if, if you need to get up and if, and if you need to go, I just, I just bless you, okay? I don't want you to feel condemned or feel like you're in trouble. But I'm going, to, I'm going to spend the next 15 or so minutes telling you about an encounter that I had with Jesus that changed everything, okay? Now, I have, I have never publicly got up and said this, what I'm about to say to you. And I say this to you, and I also say this, that at the end of this encounter that I had with Jesus, Jesus gave me a gift, and he said... I'm going to give you the ability to impart it when you tell this story. Whoa. And I heard that from the Lord himself. Now, now friends, you know, whenever, you, whenever I hear people say things like, you know, they had this encounter with Jesus and he showed up and he did this and he did that and he did this and he did that. You know, I, there have been times in my life where I have been very critical of those kinds of things. And 
But I want to tell you, after a while, when you have enough crazy encounters with Jesus, and I'm, there's some stuff that's happened between me and God, I ain't never going to tell nobody. It's so far out there, man. It's crazy. Um, I, I, I had the Lord tell me one time, go down to uh, Padre Island, go get in the ocean, and I'll meet you there. I said, okay. So I went down to the island of the Father, Padre Island. <laughs> and at 11.11, I went out and got in the water, and I was the only person out there. There was nobody else out there at 11.11. At I didn't want to touch the water until 11.11. Now, you're like, Dadgummit Troy, that's just so stupid. That's just ridiculous. You know... <laughs> I just want to just tell you that there's, there's a life that you can live that is just so intimate with Jesus. And, and, and listen, I don't, I, there's, I, there's a lot of things that I don't have, and there's a lot of things I don't do right, and I've messed up so many times. But I want to tell you, man, I love Jesus, and I've, I love to love Jesus. And you have to learn to love to love Jesus. It's one thing to say, you know, man, I love God, but it's another thing, dude, I, I love it that I love God. And I want to love him more today than I loved him yesterday. And I want to be more responsible today, more responsive to him today than I was this. Anyway, to make a very long story short with this, I was, I was, I'd walked out to where the water was like maybe knee deep and it was pitch black. And yeah, I'm in the ocean and it's just pitch dark. And so I just sat down and kind of put my arms behind me and I'm just sitting there and way down the beach, I can see this guy walking towards me and I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, I really felt like that you asked me to come here and this is my privilege and there's a billion stars and it's beautiful and I'm out in the ocean all by myself at 11 o'clock at night. It's just crazy cool and I love it. And I'm like, Lord, I want to pray. I want to pray for my bride and God, I want to pray for God for my kids. And, and Lord, I do. I want to present some things to you that I'm concerned about and I just want to spend time with you. But I can see this guy walking way down. I mean, he's like a, more than a mile away and I can see him and every so often he comes into the light that's on the beach and then he's in the darkness and then he's you know closer. Do you know what I mean? You know how there's kind of a circle of light, you know, around those lights? And I see him and I think, well, he can't see me, you know, and he's got like a hoodie, you know, and uh, he's walking down the beach and so I, I get real quiet, and I'm not going to pray anymore. I want him to get past me, you know. And I don't, and I'm, you know, I'm just, just like this. I'm just sitting down. And I had looked, and I can't see him anymore. So I'll keep waiting to see him, you know. And now I should see him go down there, right? And I wait and wait and wait. I'm just like, yes, Jesus. And I went, where did that guy go? And I turn around, and he's standing directly behind me. <laughs> I'm talking about standing directly behind do, do, me. Do, 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 do. Oh, Yeah. I'm ready. I'm, I'm about to swim to Cuba. I didn't have a pistol on me. And I'm just like, and I went, hey. And he said, hello. And he goes, what are you doing out here? I said, I'm seeking the Lord. And he doesn't say anything. And I said, did you hear what I said? And he said, yes. And I'm like, can I help you, dude? Because <laughs> he's like, you know, 40 feet back, directly behind me. And he's just freaking me out. And I'm like, okay, man, well, I'm going to keep praying. And I'm going to, I'll see you, man. Have a, have a good evening, dude. And he just starts to walk. And I'm watching him walk off. I'm like, Jesus, that was weird, man. I can't believe he saw me out here in the dark like this. And I'm praying, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to get back in the groove and all this. And he gets probably, I'm going to say, 60 to 80 yards away. And I'm just kind of, kind of keeping my eye on him because I know that he knows I'm out there now, right? And I'm just kind of do-to-do. And he stops, and he turns around, and this is what he says. He has to yell this because he's far away, and the wind is blowing in a huge way. It's, you know, Padre Island. And he says this. He says, hey, Troy. And I said, yeah. Whoa. Woo. He said, it's cool that you seek me like this. And then he turned around and he kept right on walking. And I just sat there. 
No, I, I didn't have the nerve to chase him. I, <laughs> I, I was just, I, I, was, I was totally freaking out. And when, when the Lord told me to meet him at 11-11 in the ocean, I honestly didn't believe he would show up. And I'm checking everything within my spirit and go, I believed I was supposed to do it. I believed I could do it. I did do it, but I didn't think he would actually show up. And I thought, it's just my responsibility to seek him. I don't think he's actually going to show up in physical form. He's not going to do that. Why would he do that? Because he asked me to meet him there. And he showed up. And I can remember, guys, I got out of that, and that was a game changer. That was a big, big, big game changer for me. That, that changed things for me. And then I went and preached at Gene's church, and it got crazy. Now... In 2015, I was going through something incredibly horrible and something very, very, very personal and um, something that was trying to kill me. And I, 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 I had handled it well at first, but after, after a couple of months, I wasn't handling it very well and I wasn't handling it emotionally very well. And I don't know if anybody in here, you, know, you mentioned you had a nervous breakdown. I had a nervous breakdown in 2011. And we went through a big, huge church split in 2011. We had some really bad things happen in 2011. And I, um, I um, once you do that, and I saw how long it to took me to come out of that, I'm just very aware I can never let myself go there again, ever. And, and I, I recognize that I can't, you know, it's kind of like, you know, people who used to be drunks, they stay away from alcohol, right? Well, when you... When you go through something like that, you're like, I, I can't ever go there again, ever. I just can't. You, you just don't go there. And I started to go there in 2015. We'd only been here in this building for two years, and the Lord had been so good to us and so gracious. And there had been something that sabotaged me in the midst of this whole thing that was just really bad. And um, particularly a person that, that I really loved with all my heart, and it was next level bad what this brother did. And that's all, that's all I have to say about that. I, it was on a Wednesday night, and uh, I had to preach, and I did not want to preach that night. And I just was freaking out and had a, had a very bad thing happen. There was somebody that came into my office and yelled at me over this issue and, and just said, I don't know what kind of man you are, that you would allow this type of thing to happen, and yada, yada, yada. And I, I mean, literally, I'm about to have to go out and preach, and this guy was yelling at me in my office, and uh, I got mad. I'm talking about next level mad, and I told him, I said, you know what, you know, I'm not that this, I, you know, you, you, you involved yourself in this. I did not involve you in this, and this thing happened to me. I, I've literally been victimized by this thing, but you signed up for it, so you quit telling me how, how stupid I am. And I, and I was going off, and I was telling him this kind of stuff, and he went, okay, 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 and then he just got up and left, and I was just shaking. And I got to walk out here, you know, and people are bringing their family here and they're, they're wanting to have an encounter with God. And I'm just in no shape to be able to do anything. As soon as I got on stage, Jesus hit me in a hardcore way. And we had an incredible Wednesday night. And as soon as I walked off the stage, I just started crying. Just started just bawling again. Just as soon as I got off the stage, I was freaking out. I told Leanna, let's go to Glen Rose. This is before I lived in Glen Rose. And there's this cabin out there, and let's go to this cabin, and let's just stay out there, and it's got a jacuzzi in it, and I just want to sit out there in the jacuzzi and look at the stars and just kind of try and get right. And she said, okay. So my daughter and, my daughter and her husband went, were, were out there, and I, it was in that kind of context where I was totally defeated that I had this encounter. Now, I spent a lot of time talking about the importance of seeking God and going after it and being hungry. But I find that the most powerful encounters I have with God happen when I didn't see it coming. Wow. Okay? Right. And I'm very intentional about seeking the Lord. I'm very intentional about living that lifestyle. But the most, because I live a lifestyle of looking, right. God knows I'm going to see it. Yeah. So he'll show up in times that I don't expect him to show up. So I... I have this dream that I'm walking through the forest and I'm there and it's exactly like what Paul described. And where was that at? Was that 1 Corinthians 12? Uh, yeah, uh, 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. 
where he says, you know, oh, I remember one time, I don't know if I was in my body or not in my body. I don't know if I was here or there or whatever. In fact, I don't even want to, if I tell you it was me, it's going to act like I'm boasting. So I once knew a guy. <laughs> That's what he does. It's true. And, and, and when, you, when I do this, I, I'm telling you up front that this didn't happen because I had my act together. I was a mess, okay? And I had this encounter where it was a dream at first, and then I went into this place that Jesus had for me. And I'm walking through the woods, and I'm saying things like, Father, I know that when I seek you, I find you. And I know, God, that when I ask, you answer. And I know, Lord, that when I knock, that the door is open unto me. And I'm saying that over and over and over again. And I have this incredibly, I'm so excited. I know I'm going to find God. I know I am. I, I'm, and I'm, I'm excited about it. I know that Jesus is going to show up. And I know that it's crazy cool. And yay, man, this is going to be awesome. So I'm walking through, and there is this beautiful canopy of trees over me and there's this spot where there where there is you know that's like a hole in the canopy and light is shining down and I stand underneath that and man it feels so good to be in the light and I can see a beautiful blue sky not a cloud in the sky and then in my field of vision I see this small little 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 bitty cloud come over and I can see it a long ways off and then as I'm watching this cloud it begins to morph and shape into a cloudy picture of two horses and a chariot and some cloudy dude in the back of the chariot. And I'm like, oh, wow, cool. Jesus, Jesus, you're the one that fights my battles. And I thank you, God, for showing me that. Wow, God, I see you in the clouds, King, King Jesus. You know, when you see Jesus in the clouds, it's when he comes back for you. Oh, wow. And all of a sudden, the cloud became animated and the two horses leaped, these cloudy horses leaped. And the, the rider in the back of the chariot was like, let's go. And he grabs a hold of these cloudy reins and turns the horses towards me and starts coming directly towards me. As it gets nearly to me, the clouds blow off and it's Jesus in the back of this chariot. And I, I made eye contact and he zoomed over my head and it was like a 747 flew over. Just this immense power went over me. And as he went over the top of the far, uh, as he went over the top of the forest, I could tell exactly where he was at because he was rattling the tops of all the trees. When I first told Pastor Gloria about that, Pastor Gloria being the amazing Bible thumper she is, she opened up the Bible to whenever Brother David said, how shall I know that you go before me into battle? And David says, when I shake the top of the trees. That's, that was God's response. When I shake the tops of the trees. And I had never heard that verse before. And it means he goes before you in the battle. And, of course, he's in a chariot. He's in full battle mode, right? He stops over me, and he overshadows me. And I was no longer in the sunlight. I'm completely in the shadow. And I look up, and I can tell the dimension. One of the, one of the wild things about this, this encounter that I had was as soon as I entered into it, I was aware of a clock, Jamie, and I knew it was one hour and 33 minutes long. And I knew exactly where the timing of everything was all the way through. I'm like, okay, it's cool. I got one hour and 26 minutes and 14 seconds left of this encounter. And I was aware of the timing. I was also aware of distances. I was aware of north, south, east, and west. I was aware of when I looked around a tree, I knew how tall it was, and I knew what the circumference was. I knew all the numbers associated with everything. And the Lord overshadows me, and he's 40 feet up. And I knew that he was 40 feet, exactly 40 feet up. And I can see the bottom of this chariot, and I can see the bottom of these horses. I can see the underneath of these horses directly above me. And I see the Lord, and he looks over at me, and I barely see him, and I can see his crown as he looks over the edge of this chariot. And he's got something, and he's holding it in his hand, and he drops it, and I catch it, and it's fruit. And it's unlike any fruit I've ever seen. It's perfectly round, and it's got these perfectly round little knobs on it. It's a dark color, and it smells unlike anything I've ever smelled in my whole life, ever. And it smells so good. I look up at him, and he's just kind of looking at me like, are you going to get a bite or what? And so I'm like, okay. And I put my mouth on it. I'm just going to get a little bitty tiny nibble. And then it goes, boom, and it just explodes into me, and I supernaturally consume this fruit. And when it went into my face, I felt it wrap around inside my head and go all the way down in both of my legs, and I felt it hit the, the ends of my toes. And, I, and it felt so good. And I was like, wow! 
and I heard the Lord laugh. <laughs> Guys, can I tell you, because I've looked up every scripture of all of this, and the Bible says that the Lord laughs at his enemies. Wow. It means when he's in war mode, he's laughing. The whole thing of being overshadowed shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, right? Wow. Yep. So he drops five pieces of fruit to me. And all five are completely different, completely organic. They all look, they're different colors. They have different smells. And they feel different when I consume them. And by the way, guys, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. Amen. And when I ate the fifth one, and when I, when I caught the fifth one, it was, it was super heavy. And I'm just like, wow, I can't believe you dropped that top thing. And when I consumed it, when I put my lips on it, just as soon as I barely, barely, barely put my lips on it, it would just go boom, and it would just jump into me somehow. And the last one was such a huge experience that I had to close my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, I was elevated, and I was 40 feet up. And I was standing directly behind the chariot. I was facing north. This was east. This was west. And I didn't see when I was down below. Now I could see now that I was elevated was he had a circle of people around him. And they were all talking to him. And there were men and women and uh, their different ages. And they're saying things. They, they, there's this a game in the presence of God. I don't know why you didn't find it because I, you know, <laughs> but there's this a game in the presence of God that these guys have that is so impressive, Jamie. And this one person is saying, okay, I know what my part is in this next great move of God. I, I know what it is. And my part is this, 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 this. And all Jesus would do is point at them and go, yes. And it's a big deal when Jesus points at you and says yes yeah. to what you're saying. And I know who these people are, and as soon as I see them, I know who they are, I know where they are, I, and what I know is how much Jesus loves them. And it's mind-boggling. It's like, wow. Oh, my gosh. That woman is so loved of the Lord. Oh, my gosh. She's so important to him. Oh, my gosh. That dude. Oh, man. He, wow. It's cool how he loves God and how the Father loves him. And I know all this information about these people. But, guys, to tell you all the truth, I didn't really pay much attention to them because I can see Jesus in the back of this chariot and there's no door and I can see him. I can see him from the top of his crown to the soles of his feet and I know the second I put my eyes on him, I have 17 minutes exactly to look at him. And if I just look at this little crease right here, there's information in that. If I look at this part right there, there's a, there's a miracle in that that I know and realize, and I know I have exactly 17 minutes to look upon Jesus. And I start looking. I literally start at the top of his crown. And, Jamie, when I saw his crown, I knew about crowns like I've never known about crowns before. And this is what I saw. As soon as I saw his crown, I knew that it was a war crown because it was a crown in the front and it was a helmet in the back. And I knew that there was a crown room in heaven. And I knew that this crown was the crown of somebody else who had given it to him. That there was some saint who had lived more than a thousand years ago, and I think that the number was 1,100 years ago, that there was a saint who had lived, who had lived 1,100 years ago that fought warfare for Jesus, and the Lord gave him a crown, and he gave it back to him. And what, whenever Jesus wears a crown, he changes his crown for everything, and he changes his wardrobe for everything, and he uses the crowns that we give him because it glorifies him. And I knew that. And then as I'm, I'm looking at his face, and, and, and he is... He is the oldest person in the universe, but I was surprised at how young he looked. He didn't look, you know, I, I was sh really shocked at how young he looked. You know, he looked like he might have even been like in his late 20s or something. And I'm looking at his face and I realize everything about him is so supernatural. How his hair comes out from under his helmet is exactly the way he wants it to come out. And it comes out in a very supernatural way. So when he turns his head and does this, his hair kind of slowly does that, kind of follows behind. And the way he moves... When the Bible says that the Lord moves in mysterious ways, guys, I, I want to tell you there's a way that Jesus moves that's unlike 
anybody. Nobody can move like him. And how he moves is, if his hands go from here to there, it goes there instantly. But when you think about it, you can see it in 24 frames per second, and you can zoom in on any part of it. And so if he barely tilts his head, he... It just happens, and there's no from A to Z. It just happens. But when you think about it, you can zoom in, and you can see 24 frames per second, and you can zoom in on any part of it. And how he moves is so beautiful. I, it's, it's just, I'm just crying watching him move. Go, It's so incredible. So he knows exactly every spot that I'm, I'm looking at. Okay? When I'm looking at his eyes, he knows. And he's not acknowledging I'm there, and nobody knows that I'm there. I know that he knows I'm there. But he's continuing to point and say yes to what people are saying, right? Which means he's kind of having to turn a little bit. Then he turns a little bit more. And he's doing this to show me things about him. And I'm just standing there. And, you know, I'm super afraid of heights. And I'm 40 feet up. And I can feel, you know, like there's ground underneath me. And there's no fear at all. And friends, can I tell you something? When you get to stand in the presence of Jesus, you will not be afraid. He is the most powerful amazing person ever, but the most non-threatening person in the universe. At the same time, he pulls it off. And, and I'm, he's wearing all these war clothes, and he's in this war chariot, and he's on his way to go fight my battle, and he stopped to meet these people on the way to go fight my battle for me. Okay? So, and, I'm, and I know all this. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at him, and when I look just to the left of his eyebrows... When he, he knows exactly where I'm looking, he kind of tilts his head like that so I can see inside his crown because his crown comes down over his ears. And I can see inside. And when I do, I zoom in on his hair and I zoom in on the beautiful color. And he was right. It's, it was like black and brown with these, with these gold parts to it that was just so supernaturally awesome. And I'm looking at his hair. And when I do, guys, he turns like this so I can see inside past his ear. And what I see is this tiny little silly red ribbon tied to his hair. And I'm like, what's that? And instantly I see when he was getting dressed to go to war for me, he was sitting on a chair in his dressing room. And he has a, he has a dressing room, right? And he had his arms out like this. And they were dressing him in all of these incredible war things, right? But there were little bitty tiny kids sitting in his lap, tying little red ribbons in his hair. And he kept them in. I couldn't find a verse for that except for <laughs> suffer the children to come unto me. So I, it, it would take me more than an hour and 33 minutes to tell you all the details of this. But I'm telling you, I know the details of this. The sword of the Lord. Guys, I saw the sword of the Lord and it's, it's not an inanimate object. It's him. Mm. And it, it was a sword, but it's him somehow because he is the word. Right on, and it's him, and it's it's commanded by his mouth, and I I knew, and whenever whenever he would say yes, it go, mm, it was so powerful, it was like it was nuclear, it was like, it would be like okay, here we go, here we go, here we go, you know, and I saw he had this sash across him, and he had all these jewels on it, and they all were like, they were like medals, you know, of achievement, but they were they were jewels, and he dressed that to state who he was. And to show who he was in the situation that he was about to go into. So I saw all these things about him. And I'm aware, oh man, there's only 10 seconds left of this. There's only 9 seconds, 8 seconds. And at zero, at zero, the volume goes up to what all these people were saying. And I hear this woman speaking in this Austrian accent. And she says, I know exactly what my part is. It's the nations. And I've got this great work to do among the nations. And she starts talking about this, you've given me the nation's mountain, Lord, and I'm going to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then the Lord says, yes. And everybody's just like, wow. It's just so cool. And nobody is jealous. There's no sexual tension between the men and the women. There's no, there's no envy. There's no pride. There is just, we are all so loved of the Lord. We are all so loved of God. And it's just this amazing way that we are together in the presence of God. And it's just so beautiful. And I'm, I'm a very social person. And I pay attention to how people act whenever they're around each other. I really pay attention to that. And I'm, I'm floored and I'm staggered, staggered 
by how the things that people say, it's like the most brilliant things they've ever said, ever. It's like, God, these people are so brilliant. And it's like you bring your A game in the presence of God in such a, such a huge way. And then the last person, he says, okay, God, you've given me the media mountain, and I'm going to do this and do that and do that and do that and do that, and I'm going to work with that guy over there, and this is going to happen, and that's going to be that. And the king Jesus said, yes. And then this guy says, but Lord, and Lord had already turned away from him. And he said, yes. And he said, we're missing a piece. And the piece has to do with this, 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 this. And I'm not going to tell you all what he said. But I, I heard what he said. And he said, and that person is not among us. He's not here. And the Lord said, yes, he is. He's right over there. And Jesus pointed to me. And when he did, everybody turned and looked at me, and they all went, ah. And I knew they could see ah. me the way that I could see them. <laughs> They're like, okay, that makes sense. And then Jesus looked at me, and he said, Troy, come to me. And I walked to him. Now, guys, I'm very conscious of the way that I walk. You know, I weighed, I weighed over 400 pounds for about 15-something years, and I waddle really bad when I walk. And I hate to be filmed walking. I'm like, ah, what? <laughs> what an idiot. Just walk straight. <laughs> Not just when I walk, I just kind of walk like this, you know. And dude, when I walked to him, it was like James Bond. Dun, 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 dun. And I was so aware of how cool my walk was. I'm like, this is what I'm talking about, dude. Look at this. Dang. And when I got inside the circle, they closed the circle, and I went straight to Jesus. And, guys, there's no door on the back of this chariot. There's no door. And he's standing there, and, I mean, I'm eye to eye, face to face with Jesus Christ, the king of the universe. And I'm just sitting there looking at him. I'm looking in his eye, and he said, Troy, I have a gift for you. And I said, okay. And he holds this gift. His hands was instantly in front of him, and he's holding this gift. And I don't want to look at it because I'm aware. I've got a minute and 30 seconds. I've got a minute and 29 seconds. And I'm aware of this, and I don't want to not look at him. So I can see in my peripheral that it is a wooden box, and I instantly knew that the wood, it's not, it's not um, gold, silver, or precious stones, which is for eternity. This is wood, which means this is for my lifetime. Okay? Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. So I know that. I'm like, okay, when I, when I come out of this encounter, I'm going to have this gift. And I also knew that, it, you know, it had five sides. I knew that there were five gifts that were within it. And I knew I was instantly going to know what the first one was, and I'd have to find out what the other four were. Okay? And he's holding it up for me to grab it. And so I didn't want to take my eyes off of him. So I put my hands on it. And when I did, these three fingers accidentally touched his hand. And when I did, my fingers started worshiping Jesus. And I wasn't making it happen. And that was the only time in the entire dream that I was not comfortable. Because my fingers just lost their minds. We love you, Jesus. <laughs> love you. And I'm just looking at Jesus like, what the? <laughs> and, and the Lord just looked at me. And he didn't speak these words, but he somehow told me, no, dude, that's what happens when you touch me. Your atoms are going to worship me. That's what they're going to do. And so I'm like, okay. And I, I grab this box and I hold it to my chest. And I'm aware it's 20 seconds. There's 19 seconds, and I'm just looking at him like, don't, don't let this in. And as I'm looking at him, I'm holding it to my chest to cherish it, and it goes, eh, and it disappears. And I said, Lord, that gift you just gave me went into my heart, didn't it? And he went, yes, zero. When it zeroed out, I was in another place. I don't know where I was at. But I was in another place. I couldn't see anything. There was no fear at all. But I heard God speak to me. And it was like, it was like I was in a cloud. And it was like he was in my face talking to me. And he said, he said Troy, you're going to remember this. You're, don't worry. You're not going to forget this. You're, you're going to remember this. And you're going to remember the details of it. And you're going to find out what the other five gifts are. And you're going to meet the people that you have met in that place in your lifetime. And he said, don't worry about how it's all going to come together. Just when you wake up, 
you're going to want to wake up Leanna and tell her, but I'm going to let her rest tonight. I want you to go tell your son-in-law, JC, go wake him up, and you can, and you can tell him. You can, and, and the Lord told me, I'm going to give you the ability to release the gifts that I'm giving you when you tell this story. So for the past four years, I haven't um, publicly got up and, and told this story. I, I, I'm careful who I tell this to, and I really felt like the Lord told me this year, this is the time for you to start telling this story. And when I woke up, I tried to wake up Leanna. She wouldn't wake up. Uh, and, dude, she snores. <laughs> I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so... I sleep in perfect silence. Do y'all believe that? <laughs> so, so, man, she wouldn't get up. And I went, oh, that's what the Lord said. And then I went, and, and there was this weird part, too, where he said, go, he said, go tell JC and tell him in the jacuzzi. That's what he told me. I thought, that's weird. I go, I go to go knock on the door, and JC opens up the door before I even knock. He's like, what's up, man? And I'm like, I just had an encounter with Jesus. And he goes, let's go sit in the jacuzzi and tell me. I said, okay. And so that's what we did. And I sat out there for more than two hours telling him every single detail that had happened. Friends, I want to tell you, when I woke up, I knew exactly what the first gift was, and it was the power to gain wealth. I knew it. Now, this was in 2015. Okay? I have since discovered what three of, I've since discovered three more I think I know what the fifth one is, but I have not had it confirmed yet. But I have also discovered a third, and I have met two of those people from my dream. I had this crazy woman from Australia came up here to the church and told me, I got to meet your pastor, I got to meet your pastor, I got to And those kind of people I don't typically meet with. <laughs> I got a dream, I got I to gotta talk to your pastor. I got to go, okay, we'll get to you next year, hallelujah. I got a team of pastors here that can meet with people. I'm like, man... No. So she's like, I want to meet, 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 I want to meet. And she just won't stop. And she starts coming to these services. Hey, I need to talk to you. And I just run away, right? And so finally, Pastor Jerry says, Troy, are you ever going to meet with this lady? And I said, dude, tell her this. If she'll come out to the ranch with you guys, if she'll come all the way to Glen Rose, Texas with you guys, uh, we can go to lunch together because if it starts to, if she's, if she's crazy or whatever, then y'all can intervene. But that's my day off and I'll come in and I will spend one hour with her. And if she's willing to do that, then I'll do that. And he said, okay, that sounds good. She said, yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, no problem. So I, I'm like, well, this will be fun. It, it, this will be fun. And this will be fun. And I, you know, there's people there and, and she comes over and she gets out of the car. And when I see her, I just, I, I nearly fell down. Because I remembered her from this dream I'd had. And remember I told you that at the end there was a lady with an Austrian accent that was talking. And I'm like, there's no way that that is that woman. There is no way. There's no way. And she walks up and she says, hi, Troy. And it's hardcore, awesome accent. And I said, hi. And I'm just looking at her. And she said, before I say anything, the Lord told me to ask you something. I said, what? And she says this. Do you recognize me? I'm, I'm not making this up. I went, yes. <laughs> I'm like, this is Troy Brewer shut up time. This lady has come all the way from the other side of the world to talk to me. And I have been resistant to it. And I had no idea who she was. Jerry, am I telling a true story, Pastor Jerry? I am. So I, 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 when I woke up, I knew that I had the power to gain wealth. Guys, in January the 1st of 2016, I owed $170,000 on a house that I had bought for $50,000 25 years ago because I had mortgaged my house seven times to pay for this, the stuff we pay for, human beings and buying people out of slavery and feeding people in the orphanages, okay, because we had a small church and we couldn't fund it. So me and Leanna funded it personally by, you know, mortgaging the only wealth we had, which was our house. A little bitty tiny house, uh, not even 1,200 square foot. Um, uh, we raised our whole family in that. It was just awesome, and praise God for that house. Well, at the, on January 1st, I owed $170,000 on that place. 
Guys, within the first four months of, of 2016, I, I got five new income streams. Now, I want to just tell you this. Up until just recently, up until just recently, um, my salary of the, from the church was super, super, super low. I'm talking about a couple of hundred dollars a week. And the Lord, we're talking about, honestly, is either, what was it, Jerry? Was it 600 bucks? Is that what it was, 600 bucks a week? Or? Yes. Okay, so 600 bucks a week. And, and I was so happy to get that because that was the biggest salary I'd ever had. But we had that from, from 2010 until just recently. And so um, these income streams came to me, dude. And I didn't even go looking for them. I just figured out a way to make money here. I figured out a way to make money there. And then I got invited on John Paul Jackson's show. And then... Uh, people started buying my resources, and then uh, my book numbers that preach became required reading in theological seminaries all over the world, and then they shared their books. And we went from, we went from uh, I don't know, $20 every three months in book sales to more than $20,000 a month. Okay? Now, if you guys... If you guys buy anything through uh, Troy Brewer Ministries, all that money goes straight into Troy Brewer Ministries. But this was Amazon sales. Whew. Yeah, this is Amazon sales. And then, and then uh, I started being invited. I started getting on shows, you know, and there was one show that I was on, and they paid me $10,000 an episode and said, we'll just pay you 10000 bucks. Let us sell your books. And I said, okay. I did six of those shows that year. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into the other three new revenue streams, but I got them. And guys, by the end of the year, I had that other house completely paid off. And on my 50th birthday, I signed on my ranch. On my 50th birthday. I'm not going to say that uh, I've had it easy financially since then, but I can tell you I do have the power to gain wealth. I have it. And I'm never, ever, ever going to be poor again. Ever. I'm not. Come on. Come on. Come so on. I, I could go on and on and on about that and just tell you the unbelievable financial miracles that the Lord has done for us and he continues to do for us and he's about to do a huge. I've had it recently prophesied to me that within the next three days, there's a huge, huge financial breakthrough coming. Yeah. Okay. And um, I had somebody yesterday come up to me and say, I'm trying to think exactly what she said. She said, she said, God has a three-day miracle for you. And I said, oh, really? I was like, yeah. And I said, what does that mean? She goes, I don't know. But God has a three-day miracle for you. And then today, I had a way next-level prophetic person come to me and tell me, God told me to tell you that in three days, you have a huge financial miracle coming. And I had somebody tell me last night that God has a three-day miracle for me. And then today, somebody came and said, three days from today. Now, I... What I'm telling you this stuff to say this, that this is not theory. This is how we live, and we are normal people. We're flawed. We're messed up. We hurt. We do stuff that we shouldn't do. We're human beings. We're, we don't get things right, yet God shows up. And, and I, and I want to just I wanna close on this to say this. I'm about to pray for you, and then Jamie's going to pray for you. But because the Lord told me, he told me, you have the power you have the power to give this away. Now, it's one thing to receive the gift. It's another thing to activate the gift, and that's a whole different thing. And I believe that God's going to give you wisdom on how to activate this gift. But I can only give you what the Lord has given me, or as Peter said, such as I have, I give unto you. Um, I am not a smart guy. You know, everybody thinks I'm smart. I'm not a smart guy. And I am not a smart business guy. And I am not any of those things. Yet I'm in charge of multi-million dollar ministries now. Right? Okay. All of that happened in 2016, right after this encounter that I had with Jesus. And this is something that is in my heart. It's something that I carry with me. And it's for this lifetime. It's what I have. You can have an encounter with God that in one single encounter, absolutely everything can change for you. Absolutely everything can change for you. And the price that you pay for those kinds of encounters is that you have to learn to love how you love God. 
And you have to learn to love how you're passionate about God. You have to believe God, that God thinks it's hilarious that you're crazy about him. That God thinks it's, it's absolutely hilarious that you're willing to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and seek him until finally you're like, I'm done, I'm toast. Because that's the place where, where he will actually meet you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Even when you're done with your map and go, that's as far as I can go, I can't go. And he says, he says look for me there. Lo, I am with you. Right on? Come on. And, then, and then he shows up there. So I want to ask everybody to stand up if you would.